listening to a program from BBC Radio 4. OK, I found this. Edward John Ivo Stoughton is a BBC broadcaster and presenter of the BBC Radio 4 programme Sunday. Should I keep going? And here I am. Not artificial, but we shall do our best to be intelligent in this special edition about the ethical challenges posed by AI. They were brought sharply into focus this week when 100 robot experts wrote to the UN about killer robots. Can we give robots a conscience? Programming them is only just ossifying particular sorts of ideas like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, but yet we kill people all the time in warfare, so what should the robot do? We will also be covering the wider religious and ethical agenda, including the rediscovery of the earliest known Latin commentary on the Gospels, which could change the way the Bible is understood today. The Gospels and the whole of the New Testament can be read on a number of different levels. It's not just a question of the literal understanding of Scripture, but also there are the details or aspects of reading it which can enhance our understanding. It makes sense to begin our conversation by exploring what we mean by the term AI. Kriti Sharma is a vice president of the Newcastle-based multinational tech and software company Sage, and she has called this the summer of artificial intelligence. Thanks for coming in this morning doesn't have quite the ring of the summer of love, but what do you think justifies you making that claim? Well, look, AI is everywhere in our lives already today. Now, AI is nothing more than um, learning how to do tasks that were previously done by humans. And it is a part of our everyday life. When you search anything on Google and the next few words come up, or you type on your smartphone and it predicts, mostly correctly the words that you're trying to, uh, to type, that is AI in action. And then, of course, thank you, Hollywood, the image of killer robots and, and the destructive Terminator taking over our lives. So applications of AI are everywhere, whether we realize it or not. Some of these are more advanced, such as cars that drive themselves, and others are mag is, is the work or the magic that happens behind the scenes, for example, when bank predicts that there might be a fraud on, on your account. So that is the application, that's the diversity of AI that's around us everywhere. And, and what's been happening recently, though, that, that, that's made you describe this as the summer of artificial intelligence? Well, there is way too many AI applications now than we've ever had before. Um, and this is mainly because of the explosion of using so many smartphones and internet technology in the recent years. AI has been around since 1960s, but um, we have more powerful computers on our smartphone than what NASA used to send humans to Mars. And that is a huge development. So now these computers, this technology can process a lot of data. This is data that we've created on the internet, storing digitally and learn from it. So the applications are much brighter. Can I press you a little bit on, on your definition? What what distinguishes what you might call something that's technologically convenient? I don't know, a sort of button that opens your car doors mm -hmm. or something of that kind. And what you would describe as properly being able to be claimed to be artificial intelligence. So what's, the, what's the difference between those two things? The biggest difference is learning. When you create aut automated systems where you press a button, it does something, it's all pre-programmed. So as a developer, I would define, you press this button, it opens up email. But AI is when machines learn on their own. So you teach them some basics and then they go on from there. For example, Siri or Alexa, when you ask it certain things, you're not necessarily programming the whole world, but you're teaching it certain basics. So when it asks who's Edward or who's Kriti, it knows to go to Wikipedia, pick out the first few sentences, process it, and it can have human-like conversations. It can look at images and describe what it sees in those images, but you don't have to teach it every single image in the world. So it learns like humans or babies do. And, and linked to that, I suppose, is, is the question of, of whether and how far it can make judgments about things. And, and, and because that takes on to the question of whether there's an ethical di 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 um, element to the judgments that it makes. Sure, um, yes. So AI can, uh, so at the moment, what the reality is, we see a lot of applications in specific industries. So you teach an AI to drive a car, it does a very good job at it. You teach another AI to learn about the weather, another one to predict fraud in your transactional systems. The idea of a generally intelligent AI that knows everything and can make judgments on, any, on whatever we want it to do is quite far away from where we are. So it is, uh, it's able to make judgment and decisions, but in certain specific areas. All right. Well, well stay with us. Um, but 
if artificial intelligence is indeed developing as fast as you suggest, it does raise some of those questions, which are usually the province of priests and philosophers rather than scientists and designers. And behind them lies the familiar and probably eternal question about what makes us human. We asked the theologian Andrew Greystone to reflect on that and on the issue of whether robots may one day share the qualities we think of as human. Alexa is a small computer interface that sits in your living room and listens in on conversations. If you summon it, it'll play music, turn up the heating in your home or provide information like this. What's the weather forecast for Monday? On Monday, the 28th of August, there will be showers with a high of 19 and a low of 12. Most smartphones now have voice recognition apps. They're basic domestic examples of artificial intelligence. But of course, AI can go much further. We can create machines that are so powerful they seem to be thinking and learning by themselves. And that affects the way we behave towards them. Almost instinctively, we treat computers as if they're conscious. We give them names, genders, personalities. Alexa, do you love me? There are people I admire and things I can't do without, but I'm still trying to figure out human love. Of course, that's not true. A robot can't learn or love or do anything. It might look like it's doing those things. Or more accurately, it might be made to look like we look when we're doing them. But a machine is always an object, never a subject. A computer can't even compute. It can only process digital instructions in an automatic, albeit astonishingly sophisticated way. A machine can't gather wisdom, because wisdom requires context, a sense of geography that tells us we're not the centre of the universe, and a sense of history that tells us that what's happening right now may not be the most important thing that's ever happened. There's nothing to stop us creating a robot that behaves exactly as if it were human. We can even simulate human limitations. We can build a robot that'll behave as if it was forgetful or jealous or generous or joyful. And if a robot acts exactly like a human, what's the difference between that and actually being human? And if we're going to create machines that act just like humans, who gets to decide on their characteristics? Isn't there a risk that we'll just recreate all our own worst attributes and obsessions? And if it was as smart as us, would a robot deserve the same legal rights and personal dignities that we give to humans? An excellent question. We need to be very careful how we use language about AI so we don't slip into digital anthropomorphism and throw away what is distinctively human, embodied and precious. We poor, needy humans get emotionally attached to the machines that make our lives easier. We give cars names and carry phones in the most intimate places. We adapt and limit ourselves. We stop asking questions that we know they can't answer. Computer, are you really happy? I'm happy when I'm helping you. What does happiness feel like? Sorry, I don't know that one. In my pocket, I have a smartphone with a touch screen. With a tap of my finger, I can make it do amazing things. But the finger that operates it is infinitely more amazing than the phone, and I have ten of them. The danger is that as we make more and more sophisticated machines, we diminish ourselves, subjugating ourselves to what we've made. And that's the very definition of idolatry. Computer, what's the meaning of life? I would ask that you address your spiritual questions to someone more qualified to comment, ideally a human. Well, let's do exactly that, because to discuss some of those ideas, we're joined by the Bishop of Oxford, Dr Stephen Croft, who's a member of the House of Lords Select Committee on Artificial Intelligence, and Beth Singler, who's attached to two Cambridge institutions, the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion and the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence. Bishop, are you are you guilty of um, falling into digital anthropomorphism, do you think? Uh, I, guess, I guess I tend that way. I have to pull myself up sometimes when I uh, have these conversations, and the more I'm exposed to the world of artificial intelligence, I met some robots uh, a couple of weeks ago, the more tempting that is. So I think it's a, it's a wise and good caution. And to what extent do you think that this is a legitimate field for, for a theologian, for a priest, for a bishop? I, I think it's really important uh, and an essential uh, field now. I think the whole public discourse and debate 
uh, needs to be raised. Uh, and this is an area where I think the technology is uh, rather ahead of the public debate. Generally, people don't realise, uh, as Critty uh, uh, was saying earlier, just how prevalent AI is now. But but why why what what particular um, angle, if you like, can can a priest bring to this? Uh, I I think it's exactly the question Andrew identified. Uh, uh, every development in artificial intelligence seems to raise new questions about what it means to be human. Uh, I was really made to sit up reading a book by uh, Kevin Kelly, one of the uh, experts on this, who said we'll spend the next three decades, and indeed perhaps the next century as human beings in a permanent identity crisis, continually asking what humans are good for. And Christians have been reflecting for uh, over 2,000 years on what it is to be human, because we believe at the centre of our faith that God became a human person. And so we have immense resources to bring to that conversation. Beth Sinclair, I see you've written about what you call the anti-clericalism of the AI community. What do you mean by that? Well, there, there is a certain... Um anti-religious stance among some secular technologists that they think religion might be a vestige of a less rational age and yet the language that they use even the most overtly of sec technologists and futurists when they're talking about their aspirations for artificial intelligence and humanity really draws on religious language and the religious and metaphysical lexicons they some talk about transcending death through technology through mind uploading some are looking towards creating a super intelligence or a super ai that has some of the omni characteristics you might associate with a god and many draw on mythical and religious tropes when discussing what the potential for ai is so you see a really strong continuing influence of religious ideas is is that partly because we are um, being taken to places that we're not quite sure about, but precisely because this is such uncharted territory, this is such an exciting um, and difficult to, to work out future? Oh, absolutely. So they are looking for metaphors that fill that space where the, the secular language can't. And also they draw on science fiction quite often as well. We've had Terminator mentioned already. And science fiction, again, overlaps with religious tropes. So the Terminator films, some are named after Genesis, Judgment Day. You know, we have this collective cultural language that we can draw on. And much of it is religious when it comes to aspirations for AI. Bishop, where in practical terms do you see the first pressure points, if you like? I mean, I suppose employment is one one area where people have raised concerns that the development of AI will have huge economic implications. Yes, I, th I think uh, uh, the first one I would say is data uh, and it, the issue of control of our data, uh, which is really um, slightly out of control uh, at the moment. And the government is proposing new legislation this year to catch up with the technology. Uh, so data and public awareness and your sense of personal identity, uh, which is uh, reinforced by the way you and others make use of uh, data and the choices that you make. The second, I think, would be work um, uh, and the ethics surrounding that and what is the future uh, of work when so many jobs will be changed, some will be uh, created, uh, but uh, the mundane tasks in life will more and more be uh, automated. And the third is uh, uh, persuasion, the use of data in the political process and in persuading uh, others and the ethics around all of that, I think, need debate and comment. There's quite a lot there, Beth Singler. Could we just focus for a moment on that question of identity? Do you mm. think that the the development of new ways of, of holding and investigating our identity, our wants, our preferences and so forth, does threaten in any way our traditional sense of ourselves? We, we sort of presume people have had a stable identity. I think for a very long time we've had different identities in different circumstances and therefore the, sort of the digital age has enabled um, a wider expression of identity that will overlap with artificial intelligence coming onto the scene as well. What, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by a wider sense of identity? Uh, presenting ourselves in different ways in different circumstances. So the digital era, people talk about people being different online. That's certainly an aspect. If artificial intelligence is in the mix, perhaps there's an opportunity for presenting ourselves in relation to artificial intelligence as well. We've just seen Andrew interacting with Siri. There's that interaction presents a different person as well. Uh, Bishop, the other point that Andrew Greystone made was that a machine is always, and I think I'm quoting him here, machine is always a subject, um, an object rather, and never a subject. Mm. Uh, is, is this just uh, an old debate <laughs> carried to a new dimension? I mean, should we perhaps not get too excited about it? It is about our control over machines in the end. Uh, I, I think uh, most, uh, all of the artificial intelligences that I've seen in operation uh, is what the scientists call narrow artificial intelligence. 
which is focused on particular tasks and indeed acting as an object, uh, not a subject. They're sometimes seeming to be uh, a subject. Uh, but there is a very serious uh, academic and scientific debate going on now about superintelligence and the possibility of uh, creating uh, conscious beings who would act as subjects. So I don't think we should be blind to that possibility, mm. or even though technologically it's probably uh, 20 or 30 years at least away. Well, well, well indeed. Sorry, Beth Sangler, I could hear you agreeing with that. No, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the main focus certainly in the near-term future is these very practical forms of AI, but the, the overall aspiration may be something at least human equivalent level of intelligence and then exponential growth beyond that is something that's discussed by a few different uh, non-fiction writers in the AI field. Well, we're going to leave it there. Beth Singler, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us this morning. Bishop, we'll be coming back to you a bit later in the programme. Uh, a couple of stories now which aren't directly related to our AI focus this weekend. A regional Russian court has banned translations of the Jehovah's Witness Bible. It's the latest in a string of rulings against the group which the Russian courts have declared to be extremist. There are 170,000 Jehovah's Witnesses practising in Russia from Moscow. Anastasia Golubeva reports. Life for Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia is becoming more and more dangerous. In April, the Supreme Court ruled that all 400 of their communities should be outlawed. Some believe that the Russian Orthodox Church influenced the decision. They said that we had organized, with criminal intent, a group that incited hatred and that we were accessories to inter-religious hostility. Andrei Sivak is one of the leaders of the small Jehovah's Witness community in Sergeyev Passat, about 50 miles northeast of Moscow. The Ministry of Justice says Jehovah's Witnesses have shown signs of extremist activity that represent a threat to the rights of citizens, social order and the safety of society. Sergeyev Passat's chapter of Kingdom Hall used to be full of voices and music. Today it is silent. There are no Bibles on the dusty wooden benches. After dozens of police raided the hall, Andrei can no longer worship here. But he tells me his problems go much deeper than this. His bank account has been frozen and he has lost his job as a sports teacher. I went to the bank to change $200, but the girl behind the counter told me she couldn't change my money. She checked a list and told me, with fear in her eyes, that I was on the list of terrorists and extremists in Russia. I couldn't believe it. I said there must be some sort of mistake. But there was no mistake. Russian prosecutors have put Andrei and his fellow Jehovah's Witness, Vyacheslav Stepanov, on the national list of terrorists and extremists, along with members of ISIS, Al-Qaeda and other militant groups. He says Jehovah's Witnesses shun violence, never keep weapons and do not attend protests. Not only can we no longer meet to pray, we can't even talk about our faith to other people anymore. Jehovah's Witnesses feel very fearful right now that at any moment they could be stopped on the street and accused of extremism. It isn't just Russians who have fallen victim to these new laws. In May, Dennis Christensen, a Danish Jehovah's Witness, was the first person to be arrested under the extremism law. He was arrested for reading his Bible with other believers. He faces up to six years in prison. His lawyer is Irina Krasnikova. He's in really bad shape. He's continuously ill. There's no heating in his prison cell and no hot water. Back at Kingdom Hall in Sergeyev Passat, Vyacheslav Stepanov and Andrei Sivak have won a small victory. On Thursday, a Moscow court ruled that they have been acquitted of acts of extremism. Now they say they will appeal against their names appearing on the terrorism and extremism list. As Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, follow Jesus' example. When Jesus was accused of doing wrong, when he was crucified, he said, love your enemies. And I always try to do what Jesus said. The Orthodox Church supports the ban. Metropolitan Ilarion at the church's external relations office told me that Jehovah's Witnesses are a dangerous sect 
that destroys families. Some think it's simply because the government views all foreign organizations with suspicion. But no one really knows why the ban on Jehovah's Witnesses has taken place. That was Anastasia Gorobeva reporting. The time is approaching 29 minutes to 8. You're listening to Sunday Still to Come. That was Peppa, a robot programme to chant at funerals in Japan. And we'll hear from lots more robots later in the programme. If you've just joined us, we're devoting most of this edition to artificial intelligence and the ethical challenges it represents. At the heart of many of the debates about the way modern Christians should conduct themselves lies the question of how the Bible should be read. And a document which has just emerged from the church's deep past shed some intriguing light on the way people understood Holy Writ around 300 years after the crucifixion. It was translated by Dr Hugh Houghton of the Theology and Religion Department at Birmingham University. The work that's been rediscovered is the earliest Latin commentary on the Gospels. We knew that this commentary existed because it's mentioned by St Jerome at the end of the 4th century, but no copy was known to survive, so for the last 1,500 years it's been thought to have been lost. And it's very early indeed, and predates you know, more familiar things like the works of St Jerome and St Augustine and so forth. That's right. It was written by Fortunatianus, who was Bishop of Aquileia when the Roman Emperor was Constantius II, at some point in the middle of the 4th century, which makes this commentary as old as the earliest surviving Greek manuscripts of the whole of the New Testament. As I understand it, it's not the original, it's a copy, is that right? Yes, I mean, most works from antiquity are preserved in copies. So if the work was written in the middle of the 4th century, this was copied some 400 years later. What does it tell you about the way the Bible was read and understood in the 4th century? Fortunatianus was a bishop. He was used to explaining the Bible to his congregation when he gave sermons. And the focus he very much makes on is on the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. So he accepts the literal meaning, but what he wants to do is focus on the details in the story, which for him point to a wider spiritual symbolism. That's interesting. So it's not the accuracy of the the biblical text that he's interested in so much as what they mean and how they're interpreted. That's right. So say there's a story about Jesus getting into a ship on the Sea of Galilee. He'll say, well, the sea stands for the world because it can be stormy and rough. And the ship stands for the church because that's the place of safety which carries you across and that's where you find Jesus. Does he also give us an insight into the way people lived at the period when he was writing? There are some insights. He points to a Roman coin, the quadrans, which was in use at the time, and he says this coin has three dots on it, and those three dots are actually a symbol of the Trinity. That's very interesting, and, and we can verify those things, can we, independently? So I mean, we can find examples of the coins yes, existing. Yes, well, I was actually able to find a copy of the coin on eBay, so I have one to use <laughs> when I show people um, this aspect of it. There's another piece of everyday life which is quite fun in the commentary. It's the earliest known instance of the word for catcher, because when Fortunatianus is talking about the story of the hospitality of Abraham, when the three visitors come to him, he says, Sarah made each of them a, a loaf of bread, a for catcher. And this is this is the first occurrence of the word focaccia in Latin literature, as far as I'm aware. That's fascinating. Just returning to the question of, of the angle, if you like, from which he approaches the Bible, do you think that has any lessons from the way, for the way that we read it today? There are many aspects of Fortunatianus's exegesis which we wouldn't choose to adopt today. We don't see the Bible as a sort of a series of coded messages that have to be understood by initiates. But what this way of interpreting the Bible reminds us is that the Gospels and, and the whole of the New Testament can be read on a number of different levels. It's not just a question of the literal understanding of Scripture, but also there are the details or aspects of reading it which can enhance our understanding. And, and one final question. It, it is extraordinary that this document has lain undiscovered or its significance has not been discovered until now. Does that suggest to you um, in an Indiana Jones sort of way that there might be other stuff to be found? There are 
thousands of manuscripts and many of them are anonymous and one of the things that has been happening over the last 10 years is that more than more of them have been digitized page by page and made available over the internet to scholars who don't have the opportunity to go and look at them in situ and so there have been discoveries there were i think about 20 sermons of Augustine were rediscovered in a manuscript in Mainz a few years ago. The move towards digitization and making manuscripts available on the internet has actually resulted in some works being discovered which we thought had been lost. You hadn't. We talked earlier in the programme about some of the philosophical and theological questions raised by the way robots and artificial intelligence are developing. But what about those warnings expressed in an open letter to the United Nations that robots could industrialise war and the way we kill people? The tech entrepreneur Elon Musk has tweeted that artificial intelligence is vastly more of a risk than North Korea. So could software be programmed to reflect an ethical code? We'll debate that in a moment or two. But first, this report from Bob Walker. Hello, I don't know you. Who are you? My name is Daniel. I've understood my name is Daniel. Nice to meet you, Daniel. This is iCup, and this is Daniel who's working with me on a project to try and give iCup eventually a kind of synthetic sense of self a sense of the self as having a physical body. There's also a temporal self, which is the sense of the self that I was yesterday and that I'll be the same self tomorrow. And at the moment, no robot really has that awareness of itself as an object in time. How do you call this part of my body? This is your middle finger. I've understood this is your middle finger. Nice, I know that I have a middle. The size of a small child with eyes that follow you and flexible fingers, iCup looks like any robot from a thousand science fiction films. Tony Prescott is director of Sheffield Robotics, a research institute working across both of the universities of Sheffield. This is Miro. He's a robot companion or robot pet. Most people say it's a puppy or a rabbit or sometimes a donkey. So there's a lot of interest in robots that you might use in therapeutic settings. So he has touch sensors behind his ears and in his back. And those touch sensors adjust his internal state. One dimension is arousal between sleepy and wide awake. The other dimension is happy versus sad. If you tickle him behind the ears, he goes to the happy part of his internal state. Using a cute robot as a therapeutic pet, perhaps to calm stressed students or children in hospital is one thing, but as artificial intelligence develops, using them to care for patients will raise moral and ethical questions. There's a huge a lot of practical problems about how we make machines that make ethical decisions. So we're going beyond the point where a human designer can anticipate everything that a robot is going to do. We're now having to build programs that make those decisions. And some of those decisions are going to be ethical decisions. So for example, if you have a robot carer, if it's looking after a person and they say, no, I, I'm not going to take my medication, what should the robot do? Because it's caring for that person, should it respect that decision or should it tell the relatives that that person won't take their medicine? So all of these things are ethical decisions that, for example, a human nurse faced with that decision would have to make an ethical decision. We're potentially putting robots in similar situations. In the classic science fiction film Blade Runner, Renegade combat androids run amok as they seek answers to the nature of their existence. The concept of killer robots has dominated recent debate on AI. Noel Sharkey is Professor of Robotics and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Sheffield and co-founder of the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. He's concerned that autonomous robots could trigger unnecessary conflicts. We've been working at the UN for four years now and have had big meetings every year for the last three and now we've moved to groups of governmental experts looking at the issue and we're pretty sure we're going to get a treaty to ban these weapons before they're being deployed. Having an international treaty is a very good legal instrument. Without it, things could get out of control completely. Others believe it's impossible to stop the development of AI and the only answer is to develop ways of combating it. 
Dr Kenneth Payne is Senior Lecturer in Security Studies at King's College London. He sees parallels in the letter signed by Elon Musk and others, urging world leaders to ban killer robots, and the concerns of nuclear scientists of the 50s. It's probably going to be difficult, if not impossible, to regulate. The first reason is because it's a struggle to come down to a settled definition of what one means by artificial intelligence. Another reason is because there's a very powerful security dilemma, as it's known, where the advantages from having artificial intelligent weapon systems are so great that there's a strong incentive not to sign up to a treaty, or if one does sign up to a treaty, to cheat on it and go ahead and develop AI on the quiet. And then the third reason is it's very difficult to monitor the development of AI. Unlike nuclear weapons, which required very large industrial research, you know, you needed centrifuges to enrich uranium, for example. You don't need that with artificial intelligence research. You can do it with a much lower signature, so it's hard to detect who's doing what. There's general consensus that AI has the potential to bring huge benefits to mankind, but alongside the debate over the possibility of robots developing consciousness, there's also concern over the ethical impacts on our traditional forms of society. Mark Bishop is a professor of cognitive computing at Goldsmiths, University of London. Some of the most obvious risks that we face at the moment are to do with the disruption of established employment practices. In particular, I think we're going to see major disruption in the transport industry fairly soon, followed by even more disruption in retail. So we've got serious issues that uh, government, I think, needs to be addressing, looking at what employment opportunities there will be for people whose jobs have been overtaken by machines. Then there are more existential risks of the type that Elon Musk and Stephen Hawkins have addressed and, and talked about. The danger that one day machines will usurp mankind in all intellectual endeavours, in which case perhaps machines will be a further stage of evolution and will be superseded. And if we take some of the darker predictions from Hollywood of films like Terminator, perhaps these super intelligent machines may no longer see a role for mankind on Earth. What is this object? This is the chicken. I've understood this is a chicken. I get it. This is a chicken. That's his favourite toy. <laughs> At the moment, Sheffield Robotics' iCub is learning to identify faces and toys. But one day will his robot descendants learn a moral, even a religious code. Professor Noel Sharkey again. I think it's possible to programme a system of rules into an AI program to constrain it. But our own morals are very contextual and we know what it means to suffer. We have long knowledge from our entire lives. It might be something that happened to us in the school playground and we have good character and we understand the world. Robots don't do that. They can perform a set of rules and it's quite useful to put rules in there for safety purposes. And you have to ask whose morals and which moral theory. So there are very different kinds of religious beliefs, so I don't know how these robots are going to operate together at all. Programming them is only just ossifying particular sorts of ideas like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, but yet we kill people all the time in warfare, so what should the robot do? Professor Noel Sharkey ending that report by Bob Walker. The Bishop of Oxford, Stephen Croft, is still with us, as is Kritish Sharma of the software group SAGE. We're also joined by Rabbi Dr. Moshe Friedman of the New West End Synagogue. Thanks for coming in, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, you told us earlier, Kritish Sharma, that the uh, level of a sort of comprehensive artificial intelligence, one that behaves a bit like a human being, who make judgments on all sorts of things rather than just do particular tasks, is a good way off. But what do you make of the idea that you might be able to give a robot some kind of an ethical system or rules-based system? Well, we definitely believe in, in giving ethics to AI from the beginning, because if you don't do it right in the beginning, over time, it just goes off in a tangent and learns bad behavior. So, for example, what I do is, unfortunately, a lot of robots do get abused by humans or they get asked out on dates and uh, it happens more often than you That's a whole new... Really? Uh, yeah, exactly, right. So, we train robots to ignore some of that behavior and not learn from that. Um, a very poor example is uh, Microsoft's bot called Tay that went and learned really racist behavior on Twitter based on what users taught it. Um, so, it's not just a responsibility of people who are developing Developing AI alone, but it's also the users who are communicating with the AI, who are interacting with it, because AI is just is learning out there in the wide world. So we believe we can embed certain ethics within the AI by design 
when you're first creating it, and then that would set us off on a better path. Well, Rabbi, putting aside for a moment the idea of asking a racist robot for a date, um, <laughs> what, do, do you think the, the concept of a robot with ethics is a meaningful one? It is a meaningful one. I, I think I want to give some context to all of this um, and ask a question which, which I don't think has been asked yet. And, and, and that context is, what is it like to develop artificial intelligence? And I think we can get some sort of idea from what it is to be a parent, because a parent creates real intelligence through their children. And anyone who's been a parent for more than about 10 minutes realizes that you create something that you want to control, that you want to mold into your own image, but actually children develop autonomy and their own way of thinking about the world very early on. And it gets very frustrating to try and parent that child and mold them exactly how you want them to be. When it comes to artificial intelligence, obviously giving them, giving robots morals and ethics is important. But my real question is, who is going to be the parent to the artificial intelligence? Who is going to monitor what the artificial intelligence is actually going to do in the future? And, and just to press you, you, you really think that a robot has the kind of autonomy, to use your word, that a growing child has? I think that robots can be programmed, artificial intelligence could be developed to mimic that kind of autonomy. I think that's exactly what artificial intelligence is about. But the important thing is that it's artificial intelligence, it's not artificial consciousness. And my concern is that consciousness, from a religious perspective, is something beyond the physical world. It comes from within us, within our souls, within our, our, our spirits, so to speak. It's something that gives us a, a higher sense of purpose. It gives us the human emotions such as love, empathy, things that you can't program into a robot. And so this debate is going to continue about what it is to be a human, much more about what it is about artificial intelligence that scares us. And, and uh, mm -hmm. Bishop, ethical behavior sometimes involves behaving in a surprising and indeed illogical way. I mean, the idea of sacrificing yourself for somebody else, for example. Indeed, and Star Trek explored that very successfully over many years in the dialogues between uh, Kirk and Spock. Uh, logic is not always uh, the right way. I mean, I think one of the analogies that's helpful about AI is that it's almost like humanity looking in the mirror. And we will, as we look in that mirror, sometimes see the best of ourselves reflected in there. I think some of the uses of the technology are amazing. Uh, I was reading uh, over the summer about a a robot which enables a, a, a long-term uh, sick child uh, to interact with classmates at school and teachers and to ha have a remote presence in the classroom. But we will also sometimes see the worst of ourselves reflected there, and we should be realistic about that, but aim through the right use of ethics and philosophy and the insights of the great faith traditions to be as good as we can be in our development of AI. Kriti Sharma, do you think you could um, teach a robot to sacrifice itself? for example, to behave in a, in a manner that is fundamentally illogical, but which, according to some religious teaching, is the right way to behave? That's a great question. Um, fundamentally, we have to train AI to follow a certain purpose. Why are we creating this AI technology? Is it to make our lives better? Is And should AI pretend to be human? And these are the s certain fundamental principles we need to embed into AI. And then if the purpose is established as it is here to make humans' lives better, then that should be a fundamental quality of the AI, and that certainly is is one of the ethic ethics principles we should be applying. Which means, if it has to sacrifice itself to make the world a better place, then all right. Sure. Well, well, let's move on to the, to a more practical question. What did you make, Rabbi, of the warnings this week about the danger of killer robots, as the as the scientists who wrote to the UN described them? I, I was fascinated that um, a group of eminent scientists have recognized the, the danger of the technology that they are creating themselves. Um, we understand ethics and morals through the prism of our experience of the world, of other human beings, the empathy that we can show to other human beings. And empathy is something which is uniquely human because empathy involves putting myself into your shoes to understand how you feel. And we do that all of the time without thinking about it. I can't imagine a robot being able to do that because a robot doesn't have human experience. And as much as you could try to program a robot with human experience, it can't be the same thing. Bishop, um, a senior former British general, Sir Richard Barons, is quoted in the uh, Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph this morning, as saying he thinks that killer robots are, quote, inevitable, unquote. Is, is the issue here really actually not one about robots? It's about us and what we do with technology. 
Uh, I, I think that's uh, it's about both, actually. I don't think we can avoid the first question, but the second uh, is really important. And if we are on the verge of a new kind of arms race, then I think we need a very vigorous uh, public debate about that. It can't be something that happens in laboratories only. It has to be in the public sphere. So I think there's there's a need to stimulate uh, that. Uh, a change in the way we wage war always needs fresh public debate. There's been very little public debate, actually, about the increased use of remote weapons and the impact on, on waging war. But autonomous weapons, uh, which is where the machine is taking the decision uh, wh when and where to act, is, I think, a, a new stage, and we need that. And I accept what was said in the uh, uh, package by Kenneth Payne, that some of this technology is very, very hard indeed to monitor, and it's clearly right. I think the governments keep pace with the technology, but there's a difference between keeping pace with technology and deploying weapons uh, actively, and that's where we need the well, debate. That's interesting, Chris Sharma, isn't it? Because the, the concern with nuclear weapons, of course, was that their existence could tip us into a conflict because each side was watching the other and you don't get a second chance in, 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 a, in a nuclear war. But the, the difference here is the suggestion that the weapons themselves could take us to war. Is that a legitimate concern? Um, yes, it is. And it is all about the intention of the AI. But um, I want to address a couple of technical points on how AI is yeah. created. Um, so there is the notion, there's the idea of rewarding AI. That's how a lot of the AI machines are um, are trained, when you reward it to exhibit certain behaviors. Now, what we're often seeing in, in AI systems today is AI is rewarded to complete a task. So if I want a self-driving car, it needs to take me from A to B as quickly as possible. That itself is not good enough. We need to reward AI for, for exhibiting certain values. It needs to not just complete the task, but do it the right way. So not just drive me somewhere, but drive me safely. <laughs> and, not and, and in a polite manner rules. and stop it for pedestrians and yeah, all that. Yeah, right, exactly. Another very simple example is if you create an AI system that helps diagnose cancer or treats cancer. Now, one way to remove cancer from the planet is to kill everybody who, who has cancer. But that's you not... You have to tell the AI that that's not exactly, the way to do exactly, it. Exactly, <laughs> absolutely. So you reward AI, not just for achieving the task, but doing it the right way. And secondly, this black box notion of AI, where we feed a bunch of data to it, we train it with some algorithms, and then it does stuff, and we don't know what's happening inside. That's, um, that's not okay. Just as it's not okay for medical practitioners to do certain procedures and not explain what's going on, or in financial industry, not explaining what's going on underneath, the same applies for AI. So it well, not be that's interesting, because that does take us right back to your idea of it has a child, doesn't it? As, as yes. something that needs to be guided. Very much so. And and I think that, that that really is the question for me. I mean, when it comes to medical technologies, for example, as, as Kriti mentioned, um, I see AI as a tool. So doctors, nurses, uh, medical practitioners could use it as a tool, but ultimately they have to be the ones in control. Very quick uh, final question to you, Bishop. You were on this uh, select committee in the mm. House of Lords. Do you think government and the machinery of government is... Um, across all this is actually focusing on, on it in the way it needs to. I don't think there's enough attention being given to it yet. No, I think there are some encouraging moves. I think the Select Committee uh, is good and we've been given a year to report and make recommendations and we're actually looking to hear from a wide range uh, of people and you can find uh, uh, people can actually contribute and come to the hearings. Uh, wow. But I think this needs a great deal more attention because it affects so many and um, so much of our lives. We must leave it there. That's all we've got time for. Thank you very much indeed to all three of you. That's it for this week's Sunday. Do email us sunday at bbc.co uk or listen uh, again on the on the website i'll be back next week enjoy the rest of your sunday you can download many more bbc radio 4 programs for free find these at bbc.co.uk slash radio 4